Hi, right, welcome back everyone. Uh, we're here with another uh, economics topic. Uh, this is chapter six out of uh, Michigan's money and banking textbook. And today we're going to be talking about uh, the risk structure of interest rates. And so here's a question we want to ask. Suppose that we have a bunch of debt instruments, bonds or other similar, and we freeze or fix the time of maturity at say 10 years, just to pick an arbitrary figure here. So we take all bonds that have a maturity of 10 years. What we'll observe is that there's lots and lots of different interest rates on those 10 year bonds. Some of those bonds will have relatively low interest rates. Some of them will have relatively high interest rates. Why do they have varying interest rates even though they all have exactly the same maturity? That's the question we want to answer here. And so what we'll discover is that there are three basic reasons default risk, liquidity, and tax considerations. We'll see that these vary across these different uh, debt instruments, these, these same 10-year debt instruments, for example, and that these will generate differences in interest rates. So let's look at them one at a time. First, default risk. General definition here, that's the chance that the uh, payer on the bond will not be able to come up with the interest payments or won't be able to come up with the final face value when the bond becomes due. A general quick and dirty way to get an idea of what's called the risk premium is to take the difference between the risk free rate and the risk and the interest rate on the relatively risky bond. So, for example, if the risk free rate happens to be, say, 5% on a treasury security and the rate on a bond with possible default risk is 12%, that gives us a 7%, roughly speaking, default premium. Now, that's not an exact measure, but at least it's a quick and dirty way to get an idea of what the market prices risk at. And so not surprising, the other factor is equal. The higher the default risk, the more or the uh, higher the interest rate will be in terms of what a bond payer will have to, pay, to give to a bond buyer in order for the bond buyer to bear that chance of default. Now, the risk premium is a, is a function of two general things. First, Entity-specific factors, in other words, factors that are specific to the corporation or the government that issues the bond, and overall general macroeconomic factors. So let's take a look at these one at a time. Entity-specific factors, there are many of these, we'll just do a few. The cash flow of a business, the leverage of, co leverage of a company, for example, and the amount of collateral. To use a specific case here, Suppose that the cash flow of a business rises. Well, that'll make it more likely that they'll be able to make their interest payments and to pay off the debt at the end of the period when it's, uh, when it's uh, due, when it matures. And so other things equal, that would tend to reduce the risk premium and reduce the interest rate on a bond. Shoot, darn it. Oh, here we go, now we're back. Now, bond ratings attempt to capture these factors. Yeah, this is all live, folks. We have investment grade versus junk bonds. In general, using just one uh, measure, uh, uh, for instance here, uh, using the standard and poor's, bonds that are rated triple B or higher are classified as investment grades. Any bonds rated below triple B are, are rated as uh, junk. Now, that's that's a standard uh, way to do it. It's not, not meant to be an insult, but that's, that's the, uh, uh, the language that's used to describe it. Now, most companies actually issue junk bonds, in other words, below investment grades. Very few companies, relatively speaking, are rated investment grade, and only a very, very few companies uh, and entities are rated AAA, the highest, most safe rated bonds. Bentley, interestingly enough, has, by S&P, a single A investment grade rating, so that makes us, that, that's pretty good. Now, not surprisingly, the risk premium is correlated with the rating. Other things equal, a higher rating will generate a lower risk premium and therefore a lower interest rate on a bond. But what's interesting is that what frequently happens is that the ratings are changed sometimes only after the fact, after a default or some other bad instance. Best example here, mortgage-backed securities during the financial crisis. Many of those ended up defaulting and their ratings were changed after the fact. There's also general macroeconomic factors, economic growth, interest rates, and financial market stability, among others. And what we discover, there's a pattern here, is that when economic times become bad, 
the most, uh, the, the weakest entities are the most affected. So, for example, suppose we have a severe recession like we recently did. Well, that's going to impede the cash flow of not just a few businesses, but most businesses. And as a consequence, the uh, risk premiums of many businesses uh, and governments, for that matter, will tend to rise, and so their interest rates will tend to go up. Other examples, subprime mortgage securities. We've also seen, for example, during 2008-2009, the uh, interest rate on junk bonds relative to Treasury, that, that difference skyrocketed as people perceived junk bonds to be relatively more risky. And then finally, recently, we've had differences in European sovereign debt interest rates relative to the German interest rate. The German interest rate, is, the German bond is viewed as relatively safe. The Greek, Portuguese, and Spanish bonds, for example, are viewed as relatively risky, so they command a risk premium above and beyond the German bond. There's also differences in liquidities across bonds as well. Liquidity, what's, that's a very important concept in financial economics. Liquidity is the ease in which something, any asset, can be converted into cold hard cash quickly and without losing value. And for us, it's how quickly can a bond be sold in the financial market without losing value. And if you have what's called a thick secondary market, that means it's easy, relatively speaking, to sell a bond if you so choose. It turns out that the market for most bonds is relatively thin, meaning, meaning there's not a lot of trading. As a consequence, because there's not a lot of trading, it's sometimes difficult to sell a bond if you so choose. And the risk of you being stuck with that bond rises. And what we see is that other factors equal, if the liquidity of a bond decreases, on average, the interest rate will tend to rise simply because the holder has to be compensated for the risk of being stuck with that bond, at least for a while. And what's interesting is that uh, Treasury markets uh, tend to have a very thick market. Treasury bills, short-term government securities, have the most thick market. Long-term government securities have the least thick market. And there's differences even across Treasury securities on, on for example, the long end. In the long end of the, uh, the market, you have what are called on-the-run bonds, and you have off-the-run bonds. On-the-run bonds are the most newly issued 10-year securities, for example. Those are very liquid relative to the next uh, recent issue of 10-year bonds, which become a little bit less liquid when they become the off-the-run bond. A good example also would be the mortgage-backed securities during the financial crisis in 2007 to 2009. Not only did they experience higher default risk like we talked about, they also experienced a decrease in liquidity. And so not surprisingly, interest rates on mortgage-backed securities skyrocketed. And then finally, there are tax considerations. Not all bonds in terms of their interest payments are taxed equally. This different treatment generates different interest rates on equivalent bonds in terms of maturity. In the United States, municipal bonds are exempt from home state and federal income taxes in terms of the interest that they pay. And the intent of this is to act as a subsidy for uh, local governments and other nonprofit type institutions for a cheap source of borrowing. And we'll see an example of how that works here in just a second. And so what we have is a relatively simple formula to illustrate this. And let's suppose we have this situation. Imagine that some organization, some company, has issued a bond that pays 10%. And suppose that the uh, people who receive uh, the interest income from this bond have to pay an income tax on the interest they receive, and that the tax rate is 25%. And so, in effect, the bond holders, the owners of the bonds, only get to keep 75% of the interest income that they earn. And so what we see is that the after-tax interest rate on this bond turns out to be 7.5%, or in other words, 75% of the pre-tax rate. So keep this in mind here. And so here's what we want to do, run a simple experiment. Suppose we have two identical issuers of bonds, except in one feature. One issuer of bonds, say a standard corporation, their bondholders have to pay interest on the income. But that the holders of a municipal bond say, for example, issued by the city of Waltham, they don't have to pay interest on the income. Well, 
after tax, since those two bonds are identical in all other respects, maturity, liquidity, default risk, and so on, after tax, they should have exactly the same expected return. And so what happens is that the local government will be able to sell bonds for a 7.5% interest rate, whereas the corporation, whose interest income is taxed, has to sell bonds at 10% in order to compete. And so you can see that there's a substantial subsidy to the local government in terms of its bondholders being exempt from income taxes on the interest. And what happens is that in terms of the value of this uh, exemption is that people who are in relatively high tax brackets place the most value on being exempt from taxes. And so they are willing to pay the most for these tax exempt bonds. And so they will drive the price up and therefore the interest rate down. So that on the margin, what happens that the, what? Oh, now you've interrupted me. Now you've broken my train of thought here. Uh, so other factors equal, what happens is that as tax rates rise, that will widen the difference between the interest rate on a tax exempt bond and a bond that is not tax exempt. And so wrapping up, what we found is that there are three different and interesting reasons that even with a bond that has the same interest rate or same maturity rather, there'll be three reasons why they'll have different interest rates, default risk, liquidity, and tax consideration. Thank you.